It is good to see everyone this morning. Uh, we are in Genesis chapter 9. Uh, we have made it through the flood and uh, through the, the beginnings of a new world with Noah and his family and all the animals coming off the ark. Animal, uh, Noah makes a sacrifice to Jehovah and uh, we have things, uh, new information, information being given to Noah uh, that uh, they will uh, have, and some of these are, well, all of it, as a matter of fact, uh, is, is going to be things that are, uh, are today, such as Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Now, once we get into the law of Moses, there's going to be dietary restrictions uh, where there's certain things that the, uh, the Jews were not supposed to eat, that it was okay for the, the Gentiles to eat. Uh, and here we have these, uh, let, let, me just, let me just read this, all right, verse 4. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. We talked about that last week. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother, I will require, I will require the life of man. Verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. All right, so here going from uh, verses 3 to, to 6, we have things that are going to be taking place, that of uh, now animals are food. Prior to the flood, they were not. We looked at that. In Genesis chapter 1, 29 and 30, also chapter 2 and verse 16. And we have uh, that you know, we're forbidden to eat blood. And, and that is ignored by many cultures around the world. Uh, just uh, do, not, do not even think about the fact that this has been forbidden all the way back here. And one could say, well, we're under the New Testament today. But in Acts chapter 15, we have the same law given. Acts chapter 15. Now that's well into the age of the church. That is the law of Christ. Uh, and we also have in verse 6, the, uh, the, um, capital, the, the concept of capital punishment and the protection of human life. That human life is precious because we are all made in the image of God. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with believing everyone is, every human life is precious? What is wrong with that? If you think something's wrong with that, you need, yeah, a, there's an attitude problem that's got to change. A serious one. And yeah, there have been folks, the very, very wicked folks, that uh, they uh, saw themselves as greater than others. Of course they would and that others could die if you get them out of the way. Uh, that is, uh, that's something that we can find common uh, throughout history. Uh, but what is, what is wrong with considering each person as being a special creation? Every person having a value to them and protected. What's wrong with that? Civilization is based off of that. Civil living is based off of that. I remember, it's been a number of years ago, a, a particular a well-known man on TV, he was a, a news anchor of some sort. I've forgotten his name and I've forgotten his show, and it really doesn't matter. He had some guest on and, and um, uh, somehow the subject came up of, of a particular surgeon that was a creationist. And this particular well-known man uh, behind the desk said, there's no way I would want a creationist as a surgeon. I would want an atheist. That is foolishness. Foolishness. Because who's more likely to spare you, even if it's difficult? Who's more, who is the one who's going to see you as being a special creation by God, made in the image of God, and who's going to see you as being nothing more than an accident? 
Well, the atheist is going to see you as an ac accident. Your death is meaningless to the atheist because life is meaningless to the atheist. If an atheist hasn't come to that realization, it's time to come to that realization. I don't know, it, it's a, a matter of denial and lying to oneself, but it is true. It is true that an atheist, if, if there is no God, then truly we have no meaning. There is no meaning in our life whatsoever. There is no meaning in your existence whatsoever. There is no value in your existence whatsoever. But the creationist, however, would see here is someone made in the image of God and would take every measure to spare that person. And to somehow think that atheists are far more educated than creationists is false. That is a popular notion spread by atheists. But the fact of the matter is, you look at all of the scientific advances going throughout the ages, and who do you have? You have some phenomenal creationists some phenomenal ones. And don't ever think that every scientist is an atheist because they're not. And don't think that, that now going into uh, these universities, yeah, they on, they'll only hire, for the most part, will only hire atheists. You're gonna find them there not having to work in the practical world, not having to work in reality. They've got their own little classroom and they can, they can make up whatever reality they like. But you get into the real world in real situations and you discover that things are very different from an atheistic vo viewpoint. Reality is very different. Now, I've said enough about that. Let's go to, back to Genesis 9, verses 3 through 6. These are what is known in modern-day Judaism, modern-day Judaism, this is what is known as the Noahide Laws, which sounds like the Nagahide Laws, but no, it's the Noahide Laws, meaning the laws given Noah. And modern-day Jews, just like ancient Jews, would have realized that this is the law that was given before we get to Mount Sinai. So Abraham would have been under these laws as Noah had been. Now Abraham is given a separate law, that comes in, but he's well into his life before he is, uh, this is given to him, and that, that is circumcision. But here are these laws that are going to be for uh, the, the non-Jews. This would, this would be for everyone prior to the law of Moses. And once you have the law of Moses, then it's for everyone, these laws are for everyone, but then you have the law of Moses, which is specifically for Israel. Never think, never get caught in this thinking, because it's flawed, that somehow the, the law of Moses superseded or replaced the law of patriarchy for everyone, because it didn't. It, and one can get into that thinking, especially with, with uh, uh, certain educational materials, that maybe they didn't mean to say it that way, but it comes off that way. Uh, Nineveh is never called, is never condemned because it forsook the Sabbath. Okay, it's because of their wickedness. They're never called to obey, to... to uh, look at um, uh, observing the Passover. They're not uh, called to under the Levitical priesthood at all. Uh, there is a separation by law. But I want, uh, I bring this out because this is going to, like so many things in the book of Genesis, this is going to have a significant effect off of what occurs afterwards. Big time. Now, let's discuss something just for a moment. Concerning, uh, concerning the Bible, uh, you have a lot of enemies of the Bible, and they want to make a mockery out of things. And they will use Noah's Ark just like they will use anything else. And uh, here recently I, I saw a thing 
uh, that it, it was from a paper a long time ago, uh, quite a number of years ago. But it concerns that uh, Noah's Ark found on Mars. Okay, and it was presented, I know that the ones who, who wrote it did it and were laughing the whole time. I know it. And they had supposed photo from Mars showing what may look like the prow of a ship jutting out of rock, and then an artist's rendition of the popular version of Noah's Ark resting on the rocks of Mars. Okay, that's nothing but a mockery. That's just a mockery. And it's, it is very typical of setting up a straw man and knocking the strong man, straw, the straw man over, which is what people do when they don't have a real argument against something they know they don't have a real argument against. Okay, if it, it goes like this, if uh, uh, me and you had an argument and I could not prove that you were wrong, Matter of fact, it looked like every bit of evidence you had was right, okay? I began claiming that you believe in a flat earth, and I start shooting you down because you believe in a flat earth, and you would say, I don't believe in a flat earth, I never did. Oh, yes, you do, and it, it, that's, that is a straw man of you find something that may not even, uh, may not even be true, it doesn't matter. You find something and then you shoot it down. You, you act as though they do believe this, have always believed this, and then you shoot it down. Now, you have uh, a lot of, of folks, and it's not just today, it's been going on for a while. They look, they look for plausible arguments against the Bible. And here is the thing. If it were not for Genesis 5, really, Genesis chapter 6 through 9. Genesis chapter 6 through 9, which concerns the flood. Atheists would not say there was never a worldwide flood. They would never say there was not a worldwide flood. Matter of fact, they would admit that they would, they would gladly say, yeah, at one time, this earth was covered by water. Okay, a long time ago, this earth was covered by water. If, if there was no biblical account, no biblical account of Noah's flood, the flood in Noah's day, worldwide flood, atheists today would not argue against a worldwide flood. They would say, yeah, at one point, this earth, this planet used to be covered in water because there's evidence everywhere. But because it is in the Bible, they have to argue that it never happened. They have to argue it because that, that is the motivation to undermine the Bible, to show, try to show, try to show that the Bible has no legitimacy whatsoever. But if the, if the Bible never said anything, or if the Bible didn't even exist, it would be a common knowledge. It would be common knowledge that this earth had been covered in water many centuries ago, thousands of years ago, in fact. That, they would, that, that would be common knowledge. But because of that, they have to come up with plausible arguments as to how it wasn't. I was listening to a man he was talking about the formation, uh, having seen the formations of what had to have been a massive flood and a massive flood draining away and bringing, just carving out a canyon, deep, carving out this deep canyon and looking at what, what he referred to as strata of, of clearly it had been at this level and then at, at this level, just these terraces, this level and this level and this level and this level. And when he looked at the top, top level of all this, he had to say, how far did this even reach? How far did this reach? It had to have 
the, these mountains would have had to have been islands at that time. Okay, but he can't say it because he knows he's high in the altitude. He's high in altitude. He's way up in Tibet. He knows this is high. And if, if, it, if water, the water table was this high, if, if sea level were, were this high, well, then you have sea level going across entire continents and only the mountains would be sticking up. Okay, so he had to come up with a plausible reason as to how can this water be this high and not flood everywhere? How could it? Well, you come in with something like the Ice Age and you have large glaciers that they quite often what uh, the flood did is given to credit to the Ice Age. Okay, let me, we'll get, I'll get to the Ice Age in just a second, but let me get back to this. All right, here's my, and so, so he was saying this great enormous amount of ice was damming up all this water. Okay, do you see today anything like that? huge. Is one forming today? Nope. Is the beginnings of one forming today? Nope. Is there any evidence really that there was, and he had to say it's plausible, and that there are other, other explanations that may be, you know, you, you can't know because this whole thing would have melted away and it's gone. You'd have no evidence of it at all. It would have just become like water with the rest of the water. There's nothing there. He had to come up with something plausible instead of stating the obvious as the water level was very high at one point, extremely high. He had to. Now, let's talk about the Ice Age for a minute because it is a true statement. What I'm about to say is a true statement that this earth does have its periods where it's warmer for certain centuries and colder for certain centuries. That is, that is true. And this whole notion of uh, global warming being something that the earth has never seen before is patently false because it's all by way of the sun's activity is what it is. I, I want you to know that there have, such as in the Alps, certain uh, enormous amount of snow that melted, that as far as anyone ever knew, that snow had always been there, never melted in the summer, was always there, but a certain amount of snow melted, and what did they find? They found an old mining town. Okay they were mining the ancients. Somebody in Switzerland was mining up in the mountains. Well, you, can't, you couldn't have done it with all that snow there. And all the snow melts, and there's this mining village. It's, there are the remains of it. Well, how did that get there? Obviously, it was warmer at certain times in the past. Also, why would you call Greenland Greenland? Because today it should be block of Iceland. <laughs> And, and Iceland could be called, this is a rocky place, volcanic place land. But uh, it was, it had uh, at one time um, men and women, obviously, coming out of Norway. And they settled on the coast of Greenland because it was green. Go on the interior and you get cold. But on, on the coastland, on the coast of it, it was green, and you could actually grow crops and you could live there. But there came a point when you couldn't anymore. So are there periods of time where the earth gets colder and where the earth gets warmer? Yes. But the common idea of an ice age in which you have these enormous glaciers that carve out these paths and carve out these huge uh, uh, canyons and, and whatnot. That is 
only because they don't want, you have atheists that do not want to have to say there was a flood and the flood was very high, going back again because that's what the Bible says there was. If, if the Bible had nothing, I'm going to reiterate this, if the Bible had nothing to say about a flood, guess what the atheists would be saying today? They would be saying, you know, why it, all this information about the ancient past from the Bible, we know this earth was covered in water. Why doesn't it say a single word about that in the Bible? Why doesn't it say a single word about that? Ha! It is a flawed book. It doesn't matter which way you turn it. It doesn't matter what evidence there's going to be. Wicked people are going to do wicked things. And it's, it's that simple. And this becomes their enemy. And uh, they will also go to, we will put quotation marks to Christians of the ancient past, such as Origen or St. Augustine. And I use that term very, very loosely, when I'm talking about Christians, of, of them in their writings talking about how certain things found in the book of Genesis cannot be true because it can't be observed today. One saying, one saying that uh, it's everyone knows you cannot have the earth without sun, moon, and stars. So you can't have days of creation without sun, moon, and stars. But God said that's the way it was. You're only, you're, you're, you can't imagine, you can't imagine a world without it. But here's the thing. Can you imagine a time, all the way going back to eternity, where there wasn't an earth at all? Can you imagine that? Because that too is, is uh, evident from the Bible. That there was a point going back into eternity where until we get to day one, chronologically, for the earth, that God said, let there be light, there is no such thing as light, the way we have it in this material realm. There, before he formed the earth, there was no earth. And uh, both of these men, Origen and uh, Augustine, coming from a more of a, a naturalistic sort of approach of if I can't see it, therefore I think I will doubt it. Well, how far are they going to take that? How far are you going to take it? You can't see heaven. You can't see hell. You can't see God. You can't see angels. You can't see Satan. You can't see demons. You can't see any of those things. You can't see the, the, the things of the spiritual realm, so why not just toss it all out? Why not toss it all out? But we come back to looking for plausible arguments against the Bible, plausible arguments, and they do their best. And since when, since when do atheists care a thing about what Origen and St. Augustine said, except to show, well, these people didn't have faith either. You shouldn't have faith. I mean, that's the implication. You, Christian, you believer in the Bible, well, these in the past, Origen and St. Augustine, look, they didn't believe in Genesis, therefore, you shouldn't either. Uh, what's the news here? There's no news. There's no news. You mean some men who can be seen as religious, some men who can be seen by some as uh, having faith may not have any faith at all. Now, there's nothing new about that. Nothing at all. And uh, <laughs> I was listening to this one fellow talk about there's actually a subset of Christians who believe the flood was worldwide, as though here is this weird little group out there, where, where they came from, I have no idea. The, the thing about it is, is that now, they never mentioned the Jews that believed it. It's funny about that. They never mentioned the Jews that believed it. They only, because there were. 
You think that David didn't believe in the flood worldwide? You think that, that your uh, uh, rabbis of the past, I'm sure some of them are all over the board, but some of your rabbis in the past didn't believe in the worldwide flood? In, in talking to uh, rabbis, and this was a number of years ago, and doing some research, I found, I found them on, on all over the place. Uh, some that did in, in Genesis, they believed Genesis, and others that I don't think they believed anything. But what, is, what does that matter? It doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. But let's, let's talk about something for a second. And it's called uh, the lithostratigraphic column. And we may speak a little bit more about this later. But what is that? Because it's found across the world. It is the lithostratigraphic column, and it's a geology thing. And if we were to go on this property and just take an enormous core sample of the earth, and, it, and on this property it wouldn't take us long to hit rock, not at all. But if we continued on down, we would get to the, uh, we would begin to see the lithostratigraphic column. You remove that and you examine it and you will find that there are, there is strata. These are layers of rock, layers of sediment that had been put down Layers of rock, layers of rock, layers of rock, layers of rock, layers of rock. Okay, now here is the thing about it. You can take that same core sample and go to another continent, take a core sample there, and you can line those core samples up and you will see these things match. It's an astonishing thing. They match. How can a core sample here in Georgia match up with a core sample, let's say, in Australia? How, how does that happen? Now, granted, you've got different things that occur in different places of where some of the, some of the, the strata may be missing from the top because of earthquakes or because of disturbances of, of one thing or another. But you get so deep, they all match they match up. Something occurred over the earth putting this strata down. And in that strata, you'll find that when you go so deep, there are no animals found there. Not in those rocks. Those are basement rocks. There are no animal fossils in those rocks. We'll get to those in a second. But you come above those and you begin to see all of a sudden, boom, it's lots and lots and lots of living things, of plants, of animals, of, uh, of various sorts. And it's not just fish and it's not just birds, but yep, they're in it. They're, they, you will find them uh, among the fossils and in this strata, you will find them. And something placed them down in it. Something placed it down in it. Now here is the problem. The problem is this column is identical everywhere around the earth. Now it doesn't mean you find the same fossils every place you go in, in every strata. But all the strata matches up. All the strata comes together of how it is stacked. Let's just put it like this. Let's say we had uh, a set of encyclopedias going from A is on the bottom as Z is on the top. And we take this and go to other places around the world and we see A is on the bottom with their encyclopedias, A is on the bottom and Z is on the top. And it goes alphabetical throughout the whole thing. It just matches perfectly. How is that done accidentally? 
How is that done if there are only local floods and not a worldwide flood? How does that happen? There's also another thing I talked to you, I just said just a moment ago, that you go deep enough, you get into those basement rocks, that there are no fossils, animal fossils, found down there. They're not. Because these, I think everyone would agree, these were formed before animals even existed. Now, for the atheist, it'll be billions of years. For the creationist, for the ones who, who actually believes the Bible, it'll be a matter of days. But it was created, it was put down first, and then later you would have animals coming along. But here is a mystery, and I do mean a mystery in those basement rocks, because no one actually knows, and I'm talking this from the scientific community, from those who are geologists, nobody knows how those rocks form because those rocks are actually known as banded iron formations. 99 point something percent of our iron comes from the banded iron formations. No one knows our banded iron formations, these are rocks now, these are rocks with bands of iron in it. No one has ever, has any evidence of these being formed today. So how was it done? It's also well understood that these rocks, when they were formed, however they were formed, because they're not volcanic. They're not, these aren't volcanic rocks. These are, these are deep basement rocks with these bands of iron in it that it had to have been done. There is no evidence of these having been formed in the presence of oxygen. No evidence whatsoever that these things, it would appear these things were created or will give the benefit for the atheist or formed. These were created or formed when there was no oxygen on this planet and then buried. They're put under other rocks, soil and the like. They're put under all that and they, they won't be in the presence of oxygen, especially when you go in, into those rocks. Now, if they're not being formed today, how were they formed? Because they haven't answered those questions at all. Not being formed today, but still exist. How did they get there? And no one, no one seems to know, except the one who believes that God, God can create however he wants to create. Could he create a world, and here's the power of God, foreseeing the need of resources in the future of mankind. Could he create a world? Because this world, and many an atheist has agreed, not everybody, because some are just going to be hard-headed, agree that this world sure looks like it is made for man. It sure looks like it's way too convenient. We happen to need oil and the earth produces it? We don't produce oil. We take it from the earth that does produce it, and then we make it into things that are useful. The earth produced coal? We don't produce coal. The earth produced that, and we can use it. The earth had iron in it from what would seem the, the absolute beginning. And as we saw in... Uh, Genesis chapter 5 of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 4, verse 22, and as for uh, Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Now, here we have iron being used by the ancients and iron still being used by current populations. Still hasn't run out. It's still there. And it is a mystery as to how it even got there. Now, let's 
uh, let's now go to just briefly, uh, well, for whatever what time we have left. We have talked about the flood stories. And it is of note that we really do need to, to talk about the flood stories. One, let's just ask a couple of questions. How long in time can an oral story continue without being changed? That is an oral story. It's told from one person to the next, from one generation to the next. How long can an oral story be told and it doesn't alter? Well, we know that uh, there's, there's a game, and it has several names in it, of where one person whispers a couple of sentences in somebody's ear. They whisper it to the next person. They whisper it to the next person. goes down a line of people, and then the last person tells what they heard, and there are alterations along the way. And sometimes, sometimes you can actually find who began certain alterations if you did your investigative work. Who, who did it? Of, of At what point did this person change the narrative? But our next question is, how long can oral stories continue? I mean, altered or not altered. How long can they actually continue? And the answer to that is, yeah, they, they very well know. And, and this has nothing, uh, this is not the, the flood stories the legends. We're not talking about that. There is a uh, story uh, among the Klamath Indians, that's in Oregon, of uh, Mount Mazama, that's a volcano, the volcano exploding and creating Crater Lake. Okay. And it's oral. These are oral. These were spoken through the generations. And it was still spoken of, it's still spoken of to this day in these oral traditions. Now, this, this particular, uh, the, it was first written down in 1865. And of course, we now ask the question, when an account is put down in words, and I do mean it's written in words, how long can it stay? Well, it can stay a long time, as long as those words, as that, that book or that paper or whatever it is, as long as that remains, or that clay tablet, as long as it remains, then you can remain faithful to how it, it began. You can remain faithful to it. But this oral story from the uh, Klamath Indians that uh, in 1865, that it seemed like if you did a little bit of filtering through it, that you, it sounded like eyewitness account is what it sounded like, an eyewitness account. Now, we come to, uh, it, and how many other, let's just ask this question, how many other cultures have the same legend concerning Mount Mazama exploding and creating Crater Lake. Outside of that region, none. None. Nobody would. You, you have the, the same, you have those, that same legend found, let's say, let's just say lower in North America? No. South America? Mexico? Africa? Middle East, Europe, Asia, Australia. Do you do you? Uh, what about what about uh, in the the South si South Pacific, South Sea Islands? What the the Polynesians? What about them? Would they have uh, this legend concerning this exploding volcano? They would have volcanoes, but it wouldn't be the same legend at all. It wouldn't be the same story. It wouldn't have passed like that. But in every place I just mentioned, there, is, there are flood legends. Every place I just mentioned, there are flood legends. And they all have things in common. Some of them have more things in common. They all have things in common. 
wickedness of the earth, that is of mankind. A disapproving God or gods. A flood that wipes out mankind and someone saved by a boat. They all have that in common. And every legend of this magnitude has this just these common threads pointing in one direction. And as we uh, made the illustration a number of weeks ago, you go to the biblical text and there isn't fanciful language in it. It's not there. It's just giving things by way of fact. Fact number one, fact number two, fact number three, fact number four. Just giving all these facts of exactly what happened, why it happened, what occurred in all this. And these, all, of these, uh, all of these legends have to have come from a common source. They had to. And all of it is fitting in line with the biblical text, not just by way of the flood. Not just by way of the flood, but going to, because, because the, the flood ends in, in chapter 8, Genesis chapter 8. But the world population continued to be in one general area, rather tight as far as the globe is concerned, a tight area until we get to Babel, until we get to there. Then everyone went in, in the, the, to the four corners of the earth. And what did they take with them? That knowledge of the flood that they had heard. And as they continue on, whether it's what point of the compass, as they continued on, through time, of course, under oral traditions, these things would get slightly twisted or terribly twisted, depending. I mean, you could have you could have somebody that just just wants to to make it into something else, and so they do. Well, the kids growing up wouldn't know any different. They 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 wouldn't know that uh, prior to this person, uh, they were telling it much differently, very differently. Now. There are numerous things, and one can say, well, floods are common to, that's a common human condition. Living on the earth, you're going to find floods. Well, we've already mentioned volcanoes. While there are volcanoes on the earth, there's only one story concerning what occurred in Oregon. There's only one story from one region. But there's a lot of fires that occur on the earth. There's a lot of, of uh, earthquakes. There are famines, there are disease, and yeah, there are stories that surround these things, but they don't really share any commonality other than, yeah, this one's about a fire too, and here is the story, and that's the only common thing it has. Fire over here, fire over here, volcano over here, volcano over here, uh, uh, earthquake over here, earthquake over there. It's common stories, but they don't have such a common thread at all that, that link back up to the, the Genesis account, that this has to be what everything else came from. And it all fits together according to the timeline. Now, there was a particular man, we're going back into the 19th century. 19th century, that is the 1800s, he was a British scholar. He knew cuneiform or cuneiform, which is very ancient writing that would have been found in uh, the Babylonian Assyrian area, era, Sumerian era, area and era. Okay. And the British Museum, well, you have these archaeologists, not the British Museum, but you have all these archaeologists who they were excavating this site in Assyria. Of course, Assyria is ancient. Assyria didn't make it into the modern age. It was uh, destroyed by the Babylonians. And you have all of these uh, clay tablets that they ship to Britain. And they hire this particular man who know, knew cuneiform to kind of piece things together. And he comes across the Assyrian 
account of the flood. And it gets very, very specific in there. And it includes, uh, of course, animals uh, are, are, are not, I don't think every flood story includes saving the animals. Some do, some do not. But it also includes the promise that there would not be another one, and it includes a rainbow. Now, the first thing they had to say was that this predates the Bible. Well, of course it does. Of course it does. Moses doesn't come around until around, uh, around 1300 B.C., and he's told to write these things. And he's obviously talking about things that occurred centuries before he was born. So there would be plenty of people who would have spoken of it, written of it, written about it before we get to Moses even being born. This does not prove the Bible as just spinning off of the, the Assyrian story. But the fact that people were writing about it before God has Moses write, it, write about it. Because he doesn't have writing prophets. If he does, we know nothing about them. The Bible speaks nothing about them. He doesn't have writing prophets until he separates the Jewish people. Until he does that, there are no writing prophets. There were prophets. Enoch was a prophet, but not a writing prophet. He did not have uh, any kind of uh, uh, inspired work that is to be included uh, in the biblical text. But what this does is confirm that, that, that Genesis, Genesis is remarkably accurate. You know, once again, we, we turn things. What if there were, no, there were no legends? What if there were no Assyrian account? What if there weren't any of those things? Then you, the atheist would be saying, well, this is such an enormous event. Surely everyone would be talking about it. And they are. They are talking about it. They're writing about it. Those that, that had a writing system, they're writing about it. And that includes the, the Chinese. But uh, now, uh, okay, we need to end it for this morning. I appreciate everyone's attention. And I uh, thank you. And we will con hopefully continue next week.